So obviously work plays a very important role for people. I mean, we all work a lot and so we all know this. The American Bureau, uh, Bureau of Statistics took the time to calculate um, that uh, the average American at least spends across his lifespan 90,000 hours at work. So that's quite some time we spend, most of us spend in offices actually. Also work plays an important part for identity. Uh, in psychology there's a term on its own, vocational identity it is called. So workplaces itself have an importance as well. Of course, uh, according to a workplace, workplace survey by Gensler, an office design company, 90% uh, of employees um, feel that better workplace design and layout helps them to better overall performance. Who would have guessed that? <laughs> um, from the same survey, 88% uh, of C-level uh, believe that better workplace environment has a positive impact on companies' financial results. That's also quite interesting to see that. Um, so there's a belief to, to invest in that. Uh, and another fact, uh, the office interior, which greatly affects, of course, workplace design, uh, represents only 1% to 2% of overall costs for the workplace. 80% are costs for employees. And that makes uh, employees and their performance <coughs> by far the more valuable resource and also by, by far the more, the more support-worthy resource. So invest in people and not in the design or invest in the design to support your people. That's the, the message behind that. So we were thinking about shifts in work. Yeah, we were just um, wondering about what are actually the things that are going on in our culture uh, and how are they impacting our work spaces? And the first shift we noticed was that work is becoming more like home to many people. Why? What drives this? Because we spend so much time at work, more than we spend at home oftentimes. We are global workers who don't really have a home oftentimes. We have lost our roots, like we move around the whole world. Um, I can relate to this uh, a lot with the people I work with, like they come from India or Syria or wherever and the office is their home place in a way. So it really um, pushed uh, a sense of, okay, the workplace has to be cozy and warm and welcoming. We're using felt and warm materials. We are creating environments that kind of replicate living rooms or that uh, display very personal items and I can also personalize my own workspace to make it more cozy for myself. Um, the second subtle shift uh, we noticed is that work needs to be more and more communal and it's expected to be communal. So this is also connected to the previous um, point because if you don't have a home, you also don't really have a family. So where do you find your family? You find it at work if you're a global worker who doesn't know anyone in the city. So uh, there's a work-life imbalance um, going on. So instead of being like distant to your coworkers, you want to be close to them emotionally. And you want to feel like, okay, I'm part of this group. I'm part of all these people. So this drives a lot of um, specific types of spaces that um, try to bring people together in very communal settings, like a, a shared desk or um, a so-called communal table. If you are familiar with like work uh, environments, then communal table has been the thing for the last five years. Let's put a communal table in this space. And of course, an all hands meeting uh, staircase and all these things. Um, the next thing that's also connected again to the previous one, so if you're communal, um, you have to work together and this is also changing, of course, with all the digital tools around the world, you have to work in groups. So this requires becoming very um, flexible and agile in the way you work and having the spaces to come together and work together more collaboratively than before. So that means what we need, quick reconfiguration, reassembling and very uh, different types of work settings, changing them around quickly and fast. Um, what people are seriously asking for, like begging for all the time at work is healthier spaces. Help me be fit. Help me um, uh, get my back straight. Help me breathe fresh air. 
And uh, to the degree where um, this just becomes so mandatory in today's workspaces that even entire like old spaces like parking garages are given up for new types of spaces such as instead of having a parking garage you have a garage for bikes. Um, and the last one is um, the big one, the big buzzword, everybody keeps repeating digitalization, digitalization, nobody really knows what do I do with it. Um, but um, many times I've been approached and I think you had the same probably Christian by companies to say, how do I get like a digital layer into my office space and what do I do? Because it's changing all the time and I don't want to like rip out the screens again and replace them with new ones. So all these like new digital work tools create um, the sense that, oh, uh, now we can make work truly seamless. And um, people really try to integrate this digital layer into their spaces sometimes very basically by just hanging up screens, which is kind of awful, but fulfills the purpose in some cases. And sometimes um, we are starting to develop um, approaches that integrate it more seamlessly into the room so that you almost don't notice it. And of course, when different technologies converge, like AI, gesture control, and all these things, our spaces will again change dramatically. But yet the most important development is a shift in, in use. Um, the shift away from a permanent location, a one-size-fits-all solution to work. Towards the freedom to move around and use specific work tools uh, according to the, to the required task at hand. So you don't spend, like the old way is like I have a desk and it's my desk and I spend 100% of my time at this desk. And the new way is like I spend some time at my desk when I have to do um, maybe focus work or so, or emails, communication, whatever that is. Or I, uh, then I meet colleagues to do some collaborative work, then I go to the focus room and, 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 and work there silently on a task. So uh, designing workplaces changes actually from, from designing furniture and zones to, uh, to curating the perfect work tools for the, for the people, for the tasks. So which option is needed and what is the right configuration then of these options. So how do we now tackle the topic of workspaces? To tackle such a complex situation, we need a systemic approach. Uh, environmental psychology helps here. It looks at spaces less as a place, but rather as a situation. And a situation means um, it's more than a layout. It has a function like what activities do need to take place there it has a social aspect relationships but it also has uh, meanings and symbolism the communication through the place information that gets delivered through it so let's look at these individually um, so to create the perfect match quite a few aspects regarding functions need to be considered um, for one is regarding the individual work so what are job requirements? What are usability factors here? Um, also, uh, our next one is maybe uh, is regarding collaboration. Um, is it a virtual or is it real collaboration? How many people are participating? Um, what are the, um, the actions that take place there? Is it about listening or speaking or creating things? Also, proximity plays a role. How close do you need to be to others to, more, to collaborate more easily? There are near or non-work activities like resting, socializing, or by now, breastfeeding. Praying is an aspect in, 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 in many offices, uh, especially in Berlin with uh, developers from all around the world. Um, so this, um, these aspects depend on the employee's stage in life. Are they um, young and international or are they more old and have family? So what, is, what does the space actually require here? There are group activities like trainings or CEO speeches or even parties that sometimes need to find their space as well or you need to consider as functions. And there are business goals like overarching desired work attitude, like our business needs to, be, needs to work more creatively for the future or we need to be more effectively, efficiently, more transparent and so on and so on. It's very individual what, what, what businesses need as an overarching function principle in this work. 
Relationships, what needs to be considered here? They are basic human interactions. It's more about avoiding pitfalls, like um, not being too close to people, not seeing only the backs. Like in one office we had um, people um, hearing each other but not seeing each other, which is in a way a frightening situation because you hear voices but you don't see the proximity or you see people in their eyes. There are uh, stronger social ties up to friendship. Um, also, which level of, uh, of this should the environment support? Um, next is group coherence. So do we want, so it's the unified drive towards a, a common goal. Um, so how unified is the group yet? Uh, where does it need to be? How can the workplace or how can it foster this group coherence? For example, visualizing common goals or putting up customer praise or so to, to unify the group to a, to a purpose. And there are individual social regulations. So who has access to, to an individual or to groups? Think um, status or confidentiality. And in terms of meaning, there are also a few aspects to, to take a look or to consider. So what are the cultural values, the identity of a company that needs to be considered and communicated? What are brand values? It's a, also the brand needs to, uh, it's lived from inside to, to the outside. So this also needs to find its place. Both cultural values and brand values can be hung up as posters, which often is done, or the mouse pet is also a very typical thing. But um, often experiences or features are more efficient, like, uh, like often throwing parties when your cultural value is community. Um, then brand experience, which is more like a subgroup of brand values. You need to consider um, them when your office plays a role in the customer journey for your customers. Um, so what is, the, what is the stage people encounter your office and what is the specific message that they should take home from this visit? And finally, uh, the role of the office. What should the new office mean to everyone? inside and outside is it the space in which uh, which shows that you have grown up as a business or is it um is it uh, s symbolizing the home and the heart of the company many different aspects there's a lot to consider um to create an effect um or to, to create that perfect match between between uh requirements and the office space um so Alex will now talk more about how this is done. A hint, it's not like this. <laughs> um, I think Christian and me, we both love this picture of Bjarke Ingels. Uh, who knows Bjarke Ingels? Okay, some, do, some, some people here didn't know him. Bjarke Ingels basically um, has this uh, way of talking about his designs, he's creating videos that explain his designs in a very visual way. But um, let's put Bjarke aside, but what we were trying to say here was this guy is fascinated by his design, by the shape and by his ingenious of twisting it. Um, and we don't think that this is the right approach to design human spaces um, <laughs> because this is very much coming from an aesthetic uh, direction and not coming from a functional, emotional, and identity um, perspective, um, because who knows if the people he's building this skyscraper for, does this match their identity? Um, I would doubt that he checked. Um, so um, these visual guys are great. I'm not saying anything against it, but I'm saying these guys should come in when all ambiguity is gone, when it's clear what it's for, for whom, and why. Like then let these guys in and create great, amazing design. But maybe um, they're not, um, or that way of thinking is not the right to start with. So how do you start then? Tricky. It's a process, obviously. It's not the genius idea. It's a process of finding the best idea. So many people, I think, are a bit confused about the term process because they think oh a process okay I'll give you a plan and then no it's it's not a plan a process is quite the opposite of a plan so a process is something that is um, at first very unclear because you are faced with a messy environment if you think of a big organization everybody has their needs everybody wants something 
So how do you come up with a clear plan? A clear plan is do this, 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 and then this, and I tell you exactly how you do it. So that doesn't work in a messy situation like this. You are more faced with a jungle and you need to find your way through the jungle. So how do you do it? Uh, process um, enables you to find the best way to reach a goal. So you basically need a goal, break it down in some intermediate goals, and then the way you get there is pretty much up to you, up to the circumstances. So whether you take detours or shortcuts to reach these intermediate goals, that's the nature of the process and it has to be designed in a way that it's open enough to adjust for all these circumstances that are happening on the way. If you have a plan, then you will be pretty unhappy in uh, <laughs> the role of designing a new office. So what does it mean for the person who's also navigating this whole process? What kind of role do you play? Um, we think you should be an explorer, not a commander. So the commander is the guy with a plan who says, dish, 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 execute. The explorer is the one who opens up perspectives. And um, these are just some um, guidelines that in our experience make a lot of sense when you are in that role of being the process creator, of being the navigator of a group of people. So at first, try to build understanding not just in your own head, but in a group of people. The group of people can be the people who work in the office and the designers you will be working with to create this new office. Build understanding by listening to them. That's, I think, the most important point. Listen to people and then try to connect and bring things together. So listening can obviously be a qualitative approach to understanding what's going on. How do you understand a big office with many people? Um, once you have understood the connections, try to set up some goals and set goals as a group, not you yourself as the commander. Then it's time to create some solutions. Once you've understood the context, once you know where you're going, you can start getting creative about the right solutions. And only when you have maybe a set of solutions, then I would suggest to really make decisions. People often need some time to consider these solutions. Once they've created them, they're often not able to directly decide for them, unless you've prepared maybe the path so well that it's so obvious to them. But ideally, in the last stage, the decision-making should be very easy because all the entire group is on board, they know where it's headed, and the decision becomes almost obvious to them because you've prepared it very well. Um, but you might still wonder, like, okay, this seems a bit messy and complex. How can I go about this? So here are five questions that um, I usually ask myself when I, I'm in a situation like this. So you recognize this from Christian here in the middle. And we've built a process around this to get all these little uh, insights about relationships, meanings, and functions. It's five questions. Uh, the good question to start out with if you're confronted by a group of people that work together is, who are we now? Who are they now? This is asking them about who they think they are now, which can be a challenging question because people are sometimes a bit flawed in their perception of their own identity. Um, so who are they now, for example, as a brand to external people? Who are they now as an organization internally? And then the next question that makes this very interesting is, who do they want to be? Who do they want to be in the future? So the example I can give here is, you have a teenager, he's horrible at playing the guitar, but he dreams of being the big rock star, uh, Jimi Hendrix style guitarist, but there you just see the gap. And you notice this if you talk to people about their identity, if you try to find out what they think about themselves. And depending on how big this delta, this gap is, uh, you will recognize how much work <laughs> needs to be done in this space. If it's very big, then that's maybe going to be a tough project. For whom are they doing all this? Like, why are they going to this office every day? Who are the stakeholders they are working for? Who are the stakeholders you or the designer will have to work for to make the space great? Is it investors you have to please? Is it the cleaning lady? Or is it uh, the kindergarten next door? There are all these like different groups that might have a really uh, crucial impact on your design. Um, why? Purpose and values. Why are we doing all this? 
um, this can become an essential part of, of course, incorporating this in your project. If you don't understand the values that people live, then how would you design a great space for them or with them to be more precise? And lastly, to get back on the ground of things like how do we make it real? Does the rock star kid have the resources, the time, the money to like, become Jimi Hendrix or is that actually not so realistic? So these are some questions that are very helpful and if you go in cycles, you will see that if the cycle rolls, then your process rolls. If not, then, well, you just have to keep going and find the best answers and adjust all these in a chain. So now, enough theory, let's get things more concrete. Um, so uh, functions. So this is a project for a company producing investment goods, complex, heavy machinery. And they wanted to build a new headquarter that united many distributed units or distributed offices. So we started the project with a C-level workshop to find an overarching di direction that would guide us through the whole concept phase. So we looked at the current situation uh, of the business and at long-term um, long goals from a strategic point of view. And we identified it work behaviors that would help us uh, to reach these goals. Uh, and the result it would be enabling uh, transparency and overview for everyone through easily accessible information and thus achieving commitment and self-reliance. So that could be a, how, how you can start a project to find these overarching visions for the, for the new work environment. What uh, this project was about, this was a company of 800 people and how we approached it was we went in there and we had conversations with 10% of these people so we had 80 interviews one-on-one -on -one interviews with single people so they were in a protected space because there might be a lot of sensitive information you don't want to like set them in a big group where they might have to talk in front of their boss or something like this so in a more private setting you get more information um, and what we did after the interviews was they showed us their space and they showed us how they use it and they showed us like every trivial detail like for example this is my favorite the trash point <laughs> this is just taken from an example from from this project and you might think yeah trash point yeah yeah, yeah easy but it turns out this trash point is three square meters big so this is something an architect would typically maybe forget or neglect in a plan and then this trash point was actually serving for very specific functions like they had this company was producing products and so they had a lot of um, prototypes with like broken glass and broken metal and this trash point would just be kind of a bombshell of hazardous objects and they had placed their trash point in the middle of the room and people were constantly like hurting themselves there. So this is something that if you give an architect or an interior designer um, information that's not concrete about this trash point, then he might just fit, oh, whatever, paper trash point, I will just put it somewhere, or I will even forget it because, you know, we know these little buckets. So don't uh, neglect the trivial functions, and maybe um, this trash point actually could become a source of innovation. Maybe the trash point could, like, turn into a big sculpture and you completely transform the room through it. So don't neglect the seemingly trivial functions. And of, as I just said, this can create entirely new types of spaces because we found that um, people need an idea space and we created this new notion of an idea space in this office. If you go by the approach of looking in the catalog, you won't find the furniture for idea space in the catalog. So this was something we had to just develop from the ground up with them. So these were uh, rooms that were like entirely crazy for them, like a dark room with plush furniture where they could just like be in a completely different world. This project was for a business doing highly standardized tasks in a very set workflow. Uh, the proximity between teams and functions is a key to, uh, to facilitate face-to-face -face collaboration and uh, quick decision making. So we need, they needed to be close, or some parts needed to be close. So in a, in a workshop together with department heads, we, we visualized that network of relationships uh, on the wall and helped us, this helped us to place those teams close to each other that, that needed that proximity. Sometimes it can be as easy as that, 
we call that a neighborhood map and then we see who needs to be close to that and then it's part of the of the design team finally to put this into into a, a horizontal or vertical office design so another example for fostering relationships this time not involving spatial layouts and physical hardware this project was for a client who had lots of visits from existing and the potential customers in their workspace we wanted to improve the overall customer experience uh, among many physical measures we also applied behavioral change we asked the organization to change the way they referred to these clients or externals um, uh, to change them or to, to not call them uh, customers anymore but instead of call them guests uh, it's very simple it's very small but um, it changes an attitude it's it's a different attitude if you refer to someone as a guest and even if you address someone as a guest than as a customer it's not about selling it's about welcoming someone in the space and they we uh, they were using or are using this term now in referring to the people directly and also talking about these people these externals um, so it's a minor step but it um, it changes the relationship and also changes the, the customer experience in the end um, meanings another example of meanings is translating brands into spaces Un unfortunately or fortunately i don't know this is happening more and more i would say in the recent years because um, brands, I don't actually know why. Why is it happening more and more? Brands are noticing their impact they have on people and their, how they shape their opinions. So a lot of times we get um, asked, okay, our brand has this in the spirit. How can we pour it into a space and make it noticeable? Uh, one example here um, was uh, actually a client I can mention. I was at Zalando here in Berlin. They had uh, three offices, or they still have three offices, and their problem was these offices were very uh, not visible at all in the city. So they asked us, hey, how can you make our office buildings more visible? And as we are a young startup, and uh, we've just been doing everything on the fly, we don't really know um, who we are so much, and we haven't especially poured it into our spaces, so can you help us? So we developed a guideline with them for all their office spaces across Europe, for how they can make the brand Zalando more uh, experienceable, more um, tangible in the spaces. And what we did, this is just a short extract, but how you could do it, for example, is you could deduct design criteria from the brand. So these were some attributes that uh, Zalando thought would describe themselves as a brand, say they thought of themselves as being game-changing, very empowering, very inspiring and connecting. Um, and what we did with them then was develop some spatial typologies for these attributes. So we said, okay, maybe um, game changing means that there's a kind of bridge typology in the space. So there are like crazy bridges across the space that, that suddenly change your perspective of things. Or the empowering attribute was translated to a spatial type that we called the zone where you can just focus and just be in, in the zone and so on. And one of the following steps then was to really um, make this very concrete and develop design principles that uh, help you sort of nail the visual and the experiential appearance of this brand. So for example, you all know Zalando, it's a fashion um, company and it's actually a tech company because they are maintaining this huge technological platform so these were two important topics so we told them okay how do you deal with tech in your spaces and um, then we found out okay we don't want technology to be like cold and distant and like some cold screen in the wall we want it to be very tangible because they are all hackers there. So we want the cables to be visible. We want you to be able to exchange it quickly. We want you to allow touch to the screens uh, and make uh, interactions very fun and very engaging with screens in the building. So I guess this is one of the last examples. This project, uh, yet again for the company producing complex and heavy machinery, um, customers would visit the office, uh, which also hosted a production site. Uh, to uh, They came for planning, for examining, and for accepting that big machinery. 
During the process, we found out that these customers usually spend a few days in town um, visiting the offices a few times. So we decided to use the whole office and not just the production site or the showroom as a, um, as a touch point, as a, to, in, um, to, to show the spirit of the company and also to really showcase the way this company is working. So we created a space with increasing privacy or decreasing publicness from, uh, from a zone where visitors could more or less move around freely to uh, more and more semi-private spaces in the distance of this, of this headquarter. Um, and also there were tours through certain parts of the office. And we used boards and see-through material for the people to really see um, and experience that work attitude. Um, and so the office became a touch point for the brand, um, helping with the buying decision for this machinery and also for the next machineries. Uh, you may ask yourself, is this all really necessary? And um, because it might seem like a lot of um, stress and stuff to go through. And I would just like to point at um, an approach where uh, we say, no, it's not necessary actually. Why? You don't have to do it. You can do it, but you don't have to. So uh, a new way of thinking about this whole uh, process is actually also to just give a group of people an empty space and the opportunity to buy furniture, to build things, to uh, organize themselves and just create their own room. This is, I find it a very thrilling and exciting uh, new development, but I think um, obviously there are some restraints to it because you might not be able to use it for a company of 1000 people that are just semi engaged with the company. So this is maybe an approach to consider if you have a small team uh, that is very um, strongly relating to uh, your company and your space. Just keeping this as an option, I think it's a very uh, interesting experiment to carry out with your team. Um, to wrap it up, a few key takeaways. If you think about the beginning, Really look at all the existing stuff that's already out there. There's so much human-centric methodology that's readily available in different disciplines, service design and so on. Just grab that and try to transfer it. Just knowledge transfer. Try it. Um, in your role as somebody who's doing this process, always be the neutral explorer. It can be tricky sometimes because, as I said a few times, you are in a challenging environment with many needs with demagogues, with people who are trying to manipulate you maybe, so always try to maintain your neutral um, role. Design a process before making plans. So plans are useful, but do the process first and then once you know it, you can do the step-by-step -step plan for everyone else if that's necessary. Consider multiple dimensions, meanings, functions, relationships. It's helpful to look at these over and over again to discover new things that you might not have noticed, like that the trash point becomes the identity sculpture for the whole department. Um, establish overarching design principles. This can help you to stay on course when people say, ah, I like the yellow chair better or the curvy chair, then you can say, hey, look, this is the principle we established. Maybe not the curvy chair. And lastly, work systemically, not linearly. Think about the circle. Don't be frustrated when you get weird or bad answers. Just keep doing the circle and you'll end up adjusting all the little nuts and bolts to get something round and wonderful. And the wonderful thing about all this is to think human-centric and think about how you can really make an impact and help people and be happier people. That would be great. Thank <laughs> you.